If you're glad that he paid it all, let me hear you say amen. amen. And Dick, I appreciate you so much having those senior moments. It makes me feel a little bit better about myself. Uh, I think that was Brother Mike Steed, wasn't it, that you were trying to mention? Was that who? Mike Davis, excuse me, okay. Well, there's another senior moment for you. So uh, anyway, but uh, we're, we're, I did want to mention too, I forgot to tell those that are visiting with us today how glad we are that you've come to be with us. If this is your first time visiting with us, we would ask for you to grab a card out of the back of the seat in front of you, fill it out, and give us a record of your attendance, and we would appreciate it so very, very much. Also, there is a fundraiser that I forgot to mention uh, for MFUGE uh, Luncheon Fundraiser that's coming up, and I believe that's on May the 7th. So uh, we would ask the church and those that are attending to support that by coming out. It'd be a free will offering, if I remember correctly, taken at the beginning of that. So keep that in mind, and that'll help support the, the young people as they go to MFUGE. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter number 14, and we're going to focus primarily on verse 22 through uh, 33, but I want us to, to kind of lay the background of what's going on here. If you, if you go back to verse number 1 of chapter number 14, uh, we have the account there how that Herod had uh, not only put John the Baptist in prison because he had told him it was not lawful for him to have his brother's wife, and so he was put in prison, but Herod wouldn't kill him because he was afraid of the people. But there was, there was a day when, his, when Herodias' daughter, and Josephus tells us that her name was Salome, I believe is how you pronounce it, but she danced for the king, and he made the promise, I'll give you anything up to the half of the kingdom, just ask. And, and so her request that she made had already been, in, her mother had already instructed her to ask for the head of John the Baptist. And you remember the account how that Herod had John uh, beheaded there in prison. They brought the head in a charger, and they... They gave it to Salome, who took it to her, her mother. And in verse number 13, it tells us, when, Jer when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship to a desert place apart. When he got the news that John the Baptist had, had been uh, martyred and his head had been taken, um, I believe that struck home. Now, this is that personal opinion that I share with you, that Smithology again. But I believe the death of John the Baptist spoke to Jesus, and it made him, he understood at that time that it would not be that long before his life would also be taken. And so it says that they tried to get away him and the disciples to a, to a land. We know that according to Luke, I believe it's chapter number 7, it tells us that they were headed for the area, uh, the town we refer to as Bethesda, and they were trying to get away. But like so many times, when Jesus and the disciples would try to get away to rest and, and relax, People would always find out where he was, and they would always begin to throng him. And when you look there in verse number 14, it says that he saw that great multitude was moved with compassion, spent the afternoon teaching, teaching them in regards to the kingdom of God. And you remember, that's the, that's the feeding of the 5,000 there when the disciples came to him and said, Lord, it's getting towards evening. These guys need to eat. You need to send them away so they can go to McDonald's and get them a happy meal. And Jesus said, you give him to eat. And you remember he had that lunch, that little boy's lunch, five loaves and, and two fishes. And Jesus took those five loaves and two fishes and he, he blessed them and he began, they began to distribute those to the people. And the Bible tells us there in verse number 21 that over 5,000 men besides women and children were fed that evening. Now, we don't know the exact total number, but it's been speculated, speculated anywhere from ten to 12,000 people actually ate that day on that little lunch that that boy had. Then in verse number 22, it tells us there that Jesus, straight, it says, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go, go before him into the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Now let me take just a moment, and if you turn over to John chapter number 6, John's accounting of the feeding of the 5,000 says that the people were so worked up and so excited that they intended to come and take him and make him king. And, of course, we know at this time Jesus' time had not yet come. And so Jesus here is sending the disciples away so that they didn't get caught up in all the hype and all of the things that were going on. And then he spoke to the crowds and he sent them away. Verse number 23 goes on and tells us, And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. It's interesting to see in Jesus' ministry how much time 
he tried to spend with his heavenly Father. I can't tell you exactly what Jesus was praying about here, but here's what I think. I, I believe some of the things that he might have been discussing here was the approaching time of his death and what he was going to be going through. Again, the news that he heard about John the Baptist, he was every bit aware that that was going to happen, but still when it happened, I believe it shook him. And as he's up here, he's praying and he's asking for strength, he's asking for guidance, he's asking to be able to accomplish the Father's will and the Father's plan. And he's there and he's pouring his heart out uh, to the Father and seeking, seeking for the Father to give him the strength that he needs as he goes forward. Notice verse number 24 goes on and says, And the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And here's something I want us to understand as God's children. If we are in the center of God's will for our life, which, by the way, that's the safest place that we can be, is in the center of God's will for our life. But even in the center of God's will for our life does not mean that we'll not have any storms and we'll not have any struggles. I guarantee you when we're in the center of God's will for our life, the enemy is going to try to blow winds that are going to discourage us and frustrate us. He's going to try to get the waves to toss about us and get our eyes off of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's what I want to know. When we are smack dab where God wants us to be, God will work and God will move and God will get honor and glory they're out here in a boat now, and Jesus has instructed them to go to the other side. John tells us again in his account that they had rowed for 25 or 30 furlongs, which to the best of my ability, they, they, they had gone about three and a half miles. And you remember the Sea of Galilee was 13 miles long, and at its widest point it was, it was somewhere around eight miles across, and they've rowed three and, a half, uh, three and a half miles, so they're still in the midst of the sea. They've got a long way to go. The winds are blowing, the waves are crashing, and they're out there wondering, Wondering what in the world is, is going on here. The fourth watch of the night, and by the way, let me just say this. When you look at the fourth watch of the night, we're talking about in Roman time. The Romans, when they measured time, they went from six to six, and they did it in three-hour three increments. What you're talking about here, somewhere along, sometime between three and six o'clock uh, in the morning, Jesus Christ is coming to them walking on the waters. And let me just share a little bit about the condition of the disciples. In verse 13, Jesus wanted to take the disciples to get away to rest because they were tired and they were overcome. They, 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 were, they were just flat out fatigued. Have you ever got that way in your life? You're just tired. You're tired of being tired. It happens from time to time. And so they had already tried to get away. They got over there hoping that they would have time for themselves to rest and relax. The multitudes come and they, they in, they're they spend the day with the multitudes there. And then in the evening, when after Jesus had fed the multitudes, he sent them away. And now they've been spending the evening and the early morning hours fighting a storm. And after all that time, they had only, they had only progressed for three and a half miles. My guess is they're tired. My guess is they're discouraged. My guess is they may have been saying to themselves, why are we here? But there's a reason and a purpose for it. When you go on and you look there, it says in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Now, I just want you to try to picture in your mind, if you would, the winds are blowing, and we know from, from, the, from the, the, the studies that we've done before that it was not unusual for storms to blow up on the Sea of Galilee. You remember it was surrounded by mountains, and the, the wind would come in, and as the wind came in, it, it was not uncommon for storms to arise and, and, and for the winds to blow and, and, the, sea, and the waves to crash. And, and here they are, and in the midst of struggling, in the midst of being tired, in the midst of just flat out being fatigued, and now all of a sudden they're, they're not able to get to land. They're in the middle of this sea and the waves are tossing to and fro and all of a sudden they look out and they see this vision or this, this person walking on the water. be rather alarming, don't you think? I, I think about as Jesus is coming to them and, and it's early in the morning and they're tired and it says when the disciples saw him there in verse number 26 walking on the sea, they were troubled saying it is a spirit and they cried for fear. I think possibly what they looked at, maybe they thought it was that old death angel coming for them. I don't know exactly what was going on in their mind. But here's what I know. They were greatly afraid because of all the struggles that they've been going through and now this person is walking on the water. But now I want you to notice in verse number 27, but straightway when Jesus spake unto them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Here's what I want you to understand with me. No matter what the storms are, God is right there with us. 
And if we'll look to him, he can calm those waves. And he can calm those waters. And he can still that, that trouble and that discouragement that's going on in our heart. I, I think it's very interesting when, he, when it says there, be of good cheer, it is I. It is I there is the exact same words that are used in Exodus chapter number 3, verse number 14, when he said, I am. And what Jesus is displaying here, not only is he walking on the water, which is humanly impossible, but he is declaring the fact that he is God over all creation. And you may be in a struggle and you may be in tri uh, going through discouragements and trials in your life, but Jesus Christ is the one who is in control of all things, and he's the one that we can look to and we can have confidence in. When he said, be a good cheer, it is I, be not afraid, what he's saying is, keep your eyes on me. Now, I would have loved to have been there this day because in that next verse, Peter answered and said unto him, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come to thee on the water. Now, how many of you in the middle of a storm would have asked the Lord to get out of that boat and go to it? Anybody here? No, no Peter's here? I, I'm sitting back thinking, Peter, what are you thinking here? But I think what we see here is we see in Peter's life what, what I refer to as a budding faith. Peter is, grasp, is slowly grasping who this Jesus Christ is. This guy just took five loaves and two fishes and fed about ten to 12,000 people. Pretty amazing, don't you think? This guy is walking on water. This guy has left where, where, they, where they had left him, and now he is walking, and he's, if they're three and a half miles out into the middle of that sea, that means he's traveled three and a half miles, and here he is, and Peter is beginning to look at this and trying to put all the pieces together, and Peter's statement here, Lord, if it's you, bid me come to thee. I tell you what, we criticize Peter because of what happens here in the next couple of verses, but I'm telling you what, he's the only one that had the faith to get out of the boat. He's the only one that stood up and said, God, if it's you, let me come to you. And he got out, and I don't know how Peter did it. I don't know if he stuck his, his foot over that boat and, and he tested that water to see how firm it was or, or what he did. But I do know this, he got out of the boat and he began to walk. And notice that next verse when he, said, when he answered him and said, Lord, if it be thee, bid me come to thee on the water. Jesus said, come. And I think it's very interesting. When you look that word up in the Greek, it wasn't an invitation, it was a command. Okay? God is going to show the disciples what he can do in their life if they'll put their faith and trust in him. Look at that next verse. He said, he said, come, and when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Here's what I want you to understand. In all of human history, there are only two people that have been recorded to walk on water. One was Jesus Christ, and the other one was the Apostle Peter. And I want you to understand that in the, in the original, when it says that he walked on water to go to Christ, it means that he truly took those steps and walked and, and was able to do it because his eyes were on Jesus Christ. Now let me just throw this thought out for you. Here's some of that Smithology again. That boat, to me, is a symbol of our comfort. Anybody here got a comfort zone besides me? A place where you're happy with and a place where you're comfortable with and, and everything's fine as long as you can stay in that little area there because you, you, you're familiar with it, you know it, and everything's fine. Can I tell you something? Sometimes God wants us to get out of our comfort zone because if we're in that comfort zone, can I tell you who we're trusting in most cases? In most cases, we're trusting our ability, our strength, our knowledge, our our. our talents and our wisdom we, we're trusting ourselves sometimes we need to understand that God wants us out of that comfort zone he wants our eyes on him trusting him so that he can work in us and show forth himself exactly who he really is I think about Peter here when they when when he, when when Jesus is walking on the water and he said if it's you bid me come to thee and Jesus said come folks he got out of the boat folks he walked on water Folks, he was going to Jesus and everything was, was going well. He was doing the impossible. Why? Because his eyes were on Jesus Christ. But the problem is, like so many of us today, when, when he, as he was walking to the Lord and, and as he was going to Jesus, verse 30 tells us when he saw the winds and how boisterous it was, he was afraid and beginning to see, cried, cried saying, Lord, save me. Isn't that kind of the way it is in our lives? 
We'll feel the Holy Spirit of God leading us to do something. Maybe, maybe He's leading us to get involved in the Sunday school and maybe take and teach a Sunday school class, or maybe He wants us to work with the, with the kids' crew, or, or maybe there's something. I mean, he, he, lead, he leads us and guides us. And so sometimes we, we start off well. But then we begin to think about all of the struggles and all the things that, you know, we're really not confident in. We get to looking at those waves that are rolling around us. We get to li listen to that wind that's howling and going by. And then we begin to question ourselves and say, wait a minute, what am I doing here? Right? And the problem is, is that so many times we get our eyes off of the Lord Jesus Christ and we put it on our circumstances. And here's what I think the message is here in this particular passage of Scripture. When we put our eyes on the circumstances and, and the issues and the problems rather than on the one that can control and solve those problems, our faith is going to wane and it is going to shrink. I want you to know that Peter walked on water. Peter took those steps, and, and I don't know how close Jesus Christ was to that boat when Peter got out, but I know when he started, he got out and he began to walk. And he walked, and he was, he was successful in his walk until his eyes left Jesus and began to be focused on the circumstances around about him. And as soon as his eyes focused on the problems rather than the solution to the problem, he began to sink. And he began to cry out there, and he said, Lord, save me. Notice immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore did thou doubt? Now, he's not reprimanding Peter uh, in, in the sense that he got out of the boat. What he's saying to him, Peter, here's the lesson. If you want to be successful in life, if you want to accomplish the, the purpose for which I placed you here, if you want your ministry to be successful and you want to accomplish all that I have for you to do, here's the key. Keep your eyes on me. And look at me and trust me and believe in me because I can calm the storm. I, I, I can make those winds stop blowing. I can make those seas as level and, 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 and as, as, as even as glass. You've got to put your faith and trust on me. And child of God, hear me and hear me well today. We're going to go through some storms in life. We're going to fi find ourselves in circumstances that we wouldn't have chosen for ourselves. But if we'll trust Jesus Christ, we'll keep our eyes focused on Him. Not only will He give us victory, but our faith will grow because we'll see how good and how great and how powerful our God. I believe this with all my heart. I think God is talking to people, not only in our church, but in churches across America and throughout the world today, saying it's time to get out of the boat. It's time to just the status quo. It's time to quit just going through the motions. It's time to open your heart and your mind to me. It's time to allow my spirit to move in your life and get you to a place where I want you to be so that you can accomplish good for eternity in the kingdom of Almighty God. And I will tell you this, when we get out of the boat and we keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ, it is unlimited what God can do with our lives. But the key is keeping our eyes on Him. Because if I start thinking about what I can do or what I can't do, the next thing you know, I'm going to be looking at it from a negative perspective. When he told Peter, O thou of little faith, wherefore did thou doubt? Let me just remind you who our God is. In six days, he created the world. He created the heavens, the stars, and everything. He is the one that in chapter number 8, when they were going through another similar circumstance, and he was asleep in the boat, and they came to him and said, Lord, carest thou not that we perish? He's the one that, st that stood up and said these words, Peace be still, and everything was calm. This is the one that was able to feed the 5,000, as we've already talked about. This is the one that was able to raise the dead. This is the one that was able to give sight to the blind. This is the one that was able to heal those that had leprosy and all kinds of sickness. This is the one that is in control of all things, sits on the right hand of the Father now, and intercedes for you and me. And this is the one that can strengthen us and enable us to be anything he wants us to be. But it requires eyes on faith in him confidence 
in him because he ultimately is in control. Verse 32 and 33, real quickly, and when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Isn't that amazing? And then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying of a truth, Thou art the Son of God. When we get out of the boat, when we focus our eyes on Jesus Christ, when we come to the place in our life, we say, here I am, God, use me. The work that he will do in our lives for his honor and for his glory will magnify to the world exactly who he is and how great he is. And people will come and say, what an awesome God we serve. What an awesome God. I wonder sometimes after this was all said and done, and they were discussing amongst themselves if any of the other disciples said, man, I wish I'd have tried that. But they didn't, did they? God wants us to get out of our comfort zone from time to time. He wants us to follow his leadership and his direction. And he encourages us to put our faith and trust in him and let him show himself to be God. I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would, please, with heads bowed and with eyes closed.